Luke chapter 18 today. I realize that I'm preaching on the topic of standards and growing up in a uh, very conservative old school Southern Baptist church uh, that I did. Uh, I've heard a lot of messages on standards, and when I see standards, I always think, oh, Pastor's going to talk to us about how we dress and everything. And Pastor's going to talk to us about the movies we watch and how I was raised and growing up. It was about, you know, don't go to movies and we don't play cards and don't dance and everything. And at the wedding, we were, everyone was dancing and stuff, and some people came up and said, but they could see Baptists dancing. And I said, listen, it's not that Baptists don't dance, it's that white people shouldn't dance. <laughs> I said, look at that, it's ridiculous and stuff. But when I see standards, that's the first thing I thought of, and I thought it was ironic I'm wearing a suit for you, because I have standards. That's not what we're talking about today. It's to be completely different about what standards are and, and, and things. So don't come into that with that mindset. So, Luke chapter 18. Uh, we are in the fifth of our six-part series, and so we've entitled it Without Jesus, and uh, Breaking Good is our subject that we're doing. So much of your life will be determined by how you view things. Simply how you see something, and how you take it in the process, and how you determine its value, so much of your life will be based on how you view and take things and determine their worth. I'll give you an example. The Wizard of Oz, the movie. I think it's the most ridiculous movie. I watched it as an adult. I can't believe we watched it as kids. Not because it's scary or anything, because it's stupid. And there's so many bad things that take place in that. Where's Dorothy's parents? Why is she living with Auntie M and Uncle Elmer and all this other stuff? There's so many bizarre things going on. But somebody pointed this out, and I thought this is really good. It goes with how you view things. Is this about The Wizard of Oz, the ultimate chick flick. Two women trying to kill each other over shoes. <laughs> and if you really think about it, that's what the Wizard of Oz is really, the Wizard of Oz is really about. What bothers me so much about the Wizard of Oz is this. You find out at the end of the movie that everyone seems to know this, that if you throw water on a witch, she dies. Why don't the munchkins just have a fire hose? So every time she shows up, they have a fire hose and they spray any witch that shows up. The movie could be over like this. Why doesn't the good witch from the north tell her, just look, click your ears. She goes through this whole thing and could almost die and gets to the end and she goes, well, you have the way to get home all along. If I was Dorothy, I would smack her down. And then Dorothy, what a rude little brat. She goes through and tells all the lions and the men, and then she gets to this girl and goes, I'll miss you most of all. Why the lion and the tin man are standing right there. And it's like the tin man should be like, oh, you know that part I just got? It's breaking because you just hurt my feelings. Why don't you go to the back of the line, Dorothy, and ask the wizard for manners? But it's just really a horrible movie. But, see, this is why I don't have to have therapy. I think all this stuff I think about, I just think it's on you, and you have to have therapy. But, um, your perspective will change your standards. And how you view things, and the direction you do it, will change your standards. If you're taking notes, our breaking thought is this. My priorities will be determined by what standard I judge. When your priorities are wrong, everything else in your life will be wrong. Your family relationships right now are struggling. Sir, your marriage is struggling because your priorities are wrong. If I were to spend time and talk to your wife, she would say, oh, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do this. And you would come back and you would say, but I do this and I do this. Because your standards and your priorities are completely wrong. You are missing out on ministry, loving, taking care of the girl God gave you. Your family is struggling today because you have the wrong priorities. Any ladies want to say amen to that? Your morals will fail because you have the wrong priorities. Your life will be, literally, isn't this how most people who don't have Jesus, isn't this how the average person's life is? They go from one disaster to the next. One drama situation from the next to the next to the next. And the reason is they don't have the right priorities and they don't have the right standards to judge what is right and what is wrong. And as I say that and talk about standards, like I said, being raised in a very uh, traditional, old school, fundamental Southern Baptist uh, church, when I say standards, the problem is that some of you will think, well, then I have to be just like, well, I have to be just like Pastor Steve. And I should, you know, he wore, oh, I guess I should start wearing suits and ties to church. You should. No. I guess I should act like Pastor Steve. I guess I, guess I should have to change the worship. I kind of like this style of worship, but, you know, the, the people that I'm following, they say we should do this style of worship, so then I guess I should change the style of worship. I must be wrong. The problem with when we talk about standards is, we think we have to create this cookie-cutter form of Christianity. Do you know that I was raised in a church? Listen, some of you. 
I was raised in a church that they preached about men having facial hair. And that it was wrong. And you couldn't be in the choir if you had facial hair. Would you believe that? Because that was the standard that they said this is... Look, you're here and you have a beard. Alright? As long as your wife doesn't care, I don't care. In fact, if I could grow one real long, I got a great, I got a great face for a beard. Mine would be great. If I could, if my wife would let me, she always says this, you can kiss me or you can shave. And if you notice, I never have a beard. <laughs> because I'd rather kiss her. But you don't have to fall into some cookie-cutter form of what Christianity is. You keep your family and your life from dangerous situations if you keep God's standards. You know, road, they put up big barriers next to very dangerous things. If there's a cliff, they put up a, a large barrier with concrete. And in fact, they put the barrier further away from a high cliff if you've ever driven through the mountains because they want to give you some room for error. And that's what a standard is. Listen. I just kind of tell you a little bit about a standard. I have never yet found anyone who's gotten involved with drugs or, or heavy drugs that doesn't first smoke or drink. They talk about a gateway drug. I've never yet seen anybody who doesn't do heroin that first didn't smoke. I've never yet seen anybody who doesn't get involved in other type of drugs and activity that just doesn't drink. He said, well, Pastor Carlo, how about just a standard to protect your family and to protect you and say, you know what? I don't really need alcohol. My life is cool without it. There's a standard for you to protect your family. Uh, secondly, standards create security. It creates economic security. Sin is expensive. I've had people tell me about uh, uh, getting picked up for drunk driving and the, the cost of the jail and the towing. And I'm like, wouldn't it just been easier if you just didn't drink? And, and they're like, yeah, I guess it would be easier. Yeah, sin is expensive and it carries a lot of guilt and a lot of issues. It creates family stability for your kids. It creates moms and dads that your kids can count on. And it also, standards create value. What is important to you will be determined by your standards. I like baseball cards, and, and when I was younger, I had, didn't have a family, and I had more money, and I bought baseball cards and collected them. Now I just count on people giving them to me because I don't have money. But I have kids. I collect, my, I collect kids. But uh, <laughs> it's interesting, like, what one person will value a card. And, and my wife, when you would get those books, when I first had them, I'd send them all out. And I'd go there and say, hey, you see this one? The book says this one's worth, like, $150. And she's like, well, where do we turn it in? And I said, well, really, it's just what the book says. I said, it's only worth what someone will pay you for it. Your standards will determine what's valuable for you. If you have the right standards that God wants, we know what's valuable now? Your little girl becomes valuable. If you have the right standards that God wants, what people become valuable are the relationships you have. When you walk away from God, you start thinking things like houses, and bank accounts, and cars, and money. You start thinking, those are what really matters in this world. And that's not, is it? Today in Luke chapter 18, we'll meet a man who has a life-changing moment with Jesus. And really, instead of breaking good, his life is going to break bad. And just as I said about the standards of money and materialism, that's going to be his problem. And boy, I wish I could get every 20 and 30 year old, maybe even teenager in the world, to just listen to me for the next 10 minutes as we talk about this, because this young man in the Bible is the average 20 and 30 year old in America today. This is the problems that we're having economically, government, budget-wise, all of this is because we have the wrong standards and we have gotten material things so out of whack. So follow along in Luke 18, verse 18. It says this, And a certain ruler asked him, Now this is, we often refer to this man as the rich young ruler. Maybe in your Bible there's a little title above it that says the rich young ruler. He's a wealthy, self-made business type young man. Uh, his very first value is himself. His second value is his possessions. It's materialism. If you're taking notes, the biggest obstacle from receiving God's blessings is us. It's us. You, you have this idea maybe that God wants to hold back the blessings that he has for you. And by the way, when I say that, instantly you go to like the TV preachers, oh, God wants to make me rich. Really? You think that God, the blessings of God are something as silly and dirty as money? The blessings of God are relationships. They're the people that you love. They're the people that stand by you when you have cancer. They're the people that stand by you when you're bankrupt. 
You don't believe that, young people? You live your life long enough and you'll find out real quick that possessions and things are fleeting. What really matters are people that love you. Amen. And what is keeping you from experiencing the blessings of God is really you. Because the God you've replaced in your life is yourself. And you've become your own God. Look at verse 18. He says this, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, on the topic, that sounds like a good thing to ask Jesus. And he knows how to approach Jesus. He has probably a religious background into his life. He's got some training. The problem right here, though, if, if you don't read it carefully, there's a problem. He doesn't approach Jesus as God. He approaches Jesus as a good master. He is not seeking at this moment the approval of Jesus. He is really in front of... I don't think he would have done like Nicodemus and go in private. Remember John chapter 3? He goes in public and he asks this very popular uh, crowd-following rabbi that he sees and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because he thinks he's already got the answer because he's a good person. He's wealthy. God must obviously love him because that's the religious answer. Be good and if you have everything, then God must love you. That's what he's thinking. He is not seeking approval of Jesus. He really wants Jesus to tell him he's good in front of all these people. And boy, you say, well, I'm glad we're not like that today. Why do so many people buy cars? They really don't need, but it has a symbol on it. Right? Maybe a reverse peace sign symbol. Or something like that. Not a Ford, because if you love Jesus, you drive a Ford. Alright, here's Jesus. Watch how Jesus will not let this go and challenge that. He's basically just saying, you're a good person. He doesn't call him God. Look at verse 19. And Jesus said to them, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, and that is Jesus. Jesus says there right there, basically he says, If I'm good, I must be God. Because only God is good. When the ultimate standard of Jesus is wrong in your life, all the other standards will be wrong too. When Jesus is not God, when he is not the second person of the Trinity, when Jesus is not your Savior, you've asked him to come into your heart be your Lord and Savior, the payment, the penalty for your sin. When Jesus is not the Lord of your life, like we talked about last week, when he is not the one sitting on the throne, all of your other standards will be wrong and your family will struggle. Your financial situation will struggle because you will go out and you will buy things that really, if Jesus was the Lord of your life, he would probably tell you, no, don't do that. You don't need that. And you will struggle in so many areas. Your morals will struggle all because your other standards are wrong. And when Jesus is not right in your life, it has a ripple effect that goes through everything else. Look at verse 21. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth. Okay, for, for one moment there, what is this young man, what do we always call him? It might even say in your Bible, he's called the rich young ruler, right? Back up. And he's saying, I have kept these things from my youth. I've done good. All these stuff, I've kept the commandments that Jesus tells him there. I've done all of this. And he said, I've done it from my youth. Do you get that? That's like a 13-year-old saying, you know, I've been really good since I've been young. Since I've been, since I've been a teenager, I've been really good. You're just 13. You're barely into this, man. It ain't the 13-year-olds who drive most parents crazy. It's the 16, 17-year-olds you want to find a, a hole and bury them in, right? And he says, since my youth, I've been a good person. What is he looking for? He's looking for Jesus to pat him on the back and say, hey, you're a good person. Here's Jesus' answer. Look at verse 21. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. All right, Jesus refers to the Ten Commandments here, right? But if you notice, he only does count them up. Take a second. I'll wait. Okay. If you counted five, right? right? He doesn't mean all ten, does he? He doesn't. He breaks them down. There's a reason. If you're taking notes, you can view the Ten Commandments basically in two categories. First, we'll sort of take six. Adultery, kill, steal, uh, lie, honor your parents, cover your names, right? Uh, Jesus doesn't really mention number six. He kind of just goes through and does the top five right there. These are all our responsibility to men, aren't they? 
This is how we treat our fellow man. A lying, cheating, adultery, stealing, coming. I mean, this is everything that deals with your fellow, your neighbor, your wife, your family member, isn't it? And Jesus goes off and lists all of these things. And he's going to say, hey, all these things I've done since my youth. Because he's done that. What Jesus really doesn't mention are the other ones. These, the Sabbath, the Lord's name in vain, no other gods, no good. These are all of your responsibilities to God, aren't they? These have no other individual. This is everything towards God. And what Jesus is basically telling him is, look, you can meet your responsibility to men. And most of you in here, you're good citizens. You're good neighbors. Most people really are deep down in their hearts. They really want to be nice neighbors and nice to people. Most of us can do this. Look, all right, maybe the lying thing, okay, maybe that's a little hard. You know, can I look bad in this? Okay, but, but most of us, the adultery, the kill, the steal, honoring your parents and coveting your, your, your neighbor's stuff and everything, eh, maybe that's not really good, number six, and we have a struggle with it. But you know what? Most of us, four out of six, we're doing pretty good. We look at that and go, hey, that's not that bad. I mean, look, the governor's in prison. I must not be that bad. I'm doing okay. But it's when we come to our responsibility to God and what God expects out of us, that's where we struggle. You look good to man, but to God you're a sinner. And really that's all the Ten Commandments were about. It wasn't a series of do these and you'll get to heaven. The whole Ten Commandments were about creating a standard for you to look at and you to judge your life and go, I'm not good. Exactly. James says the word of God is like a mirror. And you hold it up to yourself and you see yourself and go, oh wow, there's some really bad stuff. And it's for you to change. It's for you to see that you are a sinner and you have a need and it starts with Jesus. You can meet your responsibility, men. You're good citizens, good taxpayers. And go to work and you don't beat your wife. And you, I mean, most of you are really good. Some of you don't. But most of you are really good. But none of us None of us can meet our responsibilities to God. And that's why you need Jesus. And that's why you need a measure Savior. So go back to verse 21 again. And watch what he says. He says, all these I've been kept from my youth. And you know Jesus is just thinking, since you're youth, you're just a little kid. He knows what's going on. He's God. He can read. The scariest part of the Bible is when, Jesus, when it says that Jesus knew their thoughts. Man, you can get dressed up in a nice suit. You can look good. You can carry the right Bible. And your family, you know, you fought all the way here. But there's something magic about our church parking lot because as soon as your family steps foot on it, instantaneously you become the cleavers. And you walk in and go, oh, how are you doing? Oh, everything's good. No, you almost killed each other driving here. You almost stopped the car and threw the kids out. And he's only three, right? But you got here. Now everything's perfect. Look at us. We're just, everything's got under control. No, 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 no. You're a sinner. You need Jesus. Amen? So Jesus responds. This is great. Look at verse 22. And when Jesus heard these things, he said to them, okay, watch this. Thou lackest one thing. Remember, he knows his thoughts. He knows what he's struggling with. If Jesus was talking to you, he may say, okay, thou, thou lackest one thing. He might talk about alcohol. He might talk about your inability to forgive. He might talk about the bitterness that has crept into your heart. Because you're God and you won't allow anyone else to have mercy. What does he say? Sell all that thou hast and distribute, uh, distribute unto the poor. And what does he say? Maybe even underline this in your Bible. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. This is the pattern for knowing Jesus. First, the treasure in heaven. And second, you follow him as Lord. You cannot have one without creating the other. Uh, let, let me just explain and elaborate. What I mean by this, the gift of heaven is not the end in the Christian's journey. I don't necessarily believe when you accepted Christ you had to make a full understanding of everything. I didn't know. I didn't know what the Trinity. I didn't know the virgin birth. I was a kid. And I don't believe when you accepted Christ you had to make Him the Lord of your life. But I don't believe if you truly believe and accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, it will not be created. It will not also lead to you making Jesus number one and Lord in your life. You cannot have one without creating the other. The gift of heaven, your ticket to heaven out of hell, does not end your Christian experience. It just starts it. And too many people leave it at the altar. I'm going to heaven. That's all that matters. And I, God bless you. I've had people, Christians, and I believe once saved, always said, you can't lose your salvation. And I've had people twist that doctrine and they tell me, well, I can't lose my salvation. I can't go to hell. So I can do whatever I want. And I sit there and I just shake my head and I think, 
If you met the Jesus of the cross, the Jesus of the Bible, who is so life-changing, it is not, I can't do whatever I want. It eventually ends up, I just want to do what makes him happy. I become least, and he becomes more. And with, if, if, if that's like not sleeping with my girlfriend, then it's not sleeping with my girlfriend. If that's like changing my clothes just because I just dress immodestly and stuff, then I'm going to change that. If that's changing my music because it's all... <laughs> and swear words and profanity. Maybe I'll change some of that because I just, I just want him to be happy with me. The gift of heaven does not stop your journey. It's just the beginning of it. And watch the tragic response in verse 23. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful. Why? Because he was very rich. He could have been one of Jesus' close followers. I mean, he could have been one, like, like we looked at last week, like Matthew that he pointed to and sort of probably used him as his life. He could have been someone that later on that Jesus would use his life in some sort of parable or story and talk about him that everybody knew about, that he struggled with materialism, but when he came to meet Jesus, he, he left it all at the altar and said, I don't need stuff, I just need Jesus, and I trust in faith that he'll take care of me. He could have been that guy. There could have been a gospel name after him. We could have known his name. He could have been one of the best, the greatest, his disciples, but in the end, he chooses to walk away. And you think about that, you go, man, what a, what a bonehead, what a poor decision. But I don't know how to tell you this, every Sunday there's people, there's large groups of people here, you know your need for Jesus, and you've accepted Christ, you need to move forward, he needs to start becoming Lord of your life, and taking over these areas of it, and yet, you hear me talk about it, beg you, I try to use humor, I try to use video, I'm doing everything I know how to, to get you to serve Jesus, and you choose walk away. He walks off the page of the Bible and he literally walks off of eternity. An opportunity to spend eternity with Jesus, he walks away. So standards. Let me give you three things about standards. If you're taking notes. Oh, let me throw that up here. I need a dramatic shift to create a dramatic outcome. You need a dramatic shift in your life to change the course of your life. And you need to know Jesus. Seriously, honestly, look, look at me. Seriously, are you really happy with it? Are you really happy with the direction of your family relationships and everything? Are you really happy with your addictions? Are you really happy with it? Maybe it's time for a dramatic shift. And to do that, you're going to have to have something dramatic come into your life. Look at that. I skipped one. That's why I was off. Number one is this. My best does not equal God's standards. My best does not equal God's standards. I had a rough week. Cut me some slack. All right? My best is not equal to God's standards. That's number one for standards. Isaiah 6, 4, 6 says, All our righteous, all, all our righteous are filthy rags, and all we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Again, I need a dramatic shift to create a dramatic outcome. Number two, here we go. On standards. My life is dangerous with the wrong standards. My life is dangerous with the wrong standing. Um, I drove my daughter's car uh, to Michigan, drove it back, but uh, she had an issue with batteries, so I went and I bought her a new battery, and put that in, uh, got her oil changed and everything, I got to change her spark plugs, and just sort of do some maintenance for her. And I noticed that you know one of her tires was low, so I went down to the gas station over here, free air, I don't pay for air, but the free air over here, and I had a tire gauge, it was a short little one and stuff, and it's, you know, it was a cheap one, but I thought, okay. So I started using that to inflate the tires, and I'm like, wow, her tires are at 10. Man, so I started putting air in, air in, air in, and I'm just like, this is really weird, and, and finally got up to like 40, right? I always put them at 40, I'm like, wow, this is really weird, and this is, and I thought, this isn't right, so I went home, and, uh, Went to my uh, toolbox and I got another tire gauge one. I trust out a real big one. And I put it in and the, and the gauge went up to 50 and it just went boom. And I had basically probably, and I had to let the air out and stuff, I had basically put about 80 pounds of pressure into it. All right? That's really dangerous, by the way, if you don't know. Your tires could pop and it's not a very safe thing. So I'm like, oh, let the air out before anyone notices this. But why I had done that is because I had a broken standard. The gauge I was using to, to tell me what was right and what was wrong was completely off. And because I used the wrong gauge and the wrong standard to judge, I created a very dangerous situation. Um, I have never yet had somebody come to me and say, um, I'm divorcing my husband because I just keep reading my Bible and I'm getting closer to Jesus. Man. 
I haven't yet, and maybe it will happen, but I haven't yet gone to jail or prison to meet someone and say, and them say, you know, I'm in here uh, because I gave my life to Jesus and I'm just serving Jesus more. I haven't yet, and I've gone to I've gone to AA meetings with people. I've gone to addiction meetings, and, and they've asked me to come and, and go and sit with them. I've never yet accompanied someone to an addictions ministry, and they say, you know what? I'm here today, and they stand up, and I'm a, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug addict, I'm a, one man, I, I'm a sex addict. And he said, I've never yet had anybody say all these things. And they stand up the other day and say, I'm here, and, and, and I'm like that because because Jesus is Lord of my life. And I really have. You have the wrong standards. There's a lot of young people, old people, well, older, there. Somebody got mad at me last because I said older. Older people don't listen to me very good, but young people, you will. You create your life and you gauge it by the wrong standards. Right? Money, fame, popularity, all these things. You create your life by having a good time. YOLO, you only live once, life once. Yeah, it's a limitation. You create your life by the wrong standards and you will be a very dangerous person to be around. You will cause a lot of pain, a lot of problems to people you say you love. Lastly, number three, my standards, my life is blessed with God's standards. Where are the rich man's possessions today? I don't know. I don't know if he had a two-hump camel, a three-hump, I don't know if he had a whole bunch of I don't know if he had a two-story house of clay. I don't know if he had indoor plumbing. Some people had that in the Roman Empire. I don't know if he had all the I don't know if he had a beautiful wife. I don't know. What he had going on in his life. But let me just ask you this once a bit. Whatever he had, where are his possessions today? But what he could have had, if he had sold everything and followed Jesus, he could have had Jesus. He could have been today with him in heaven. He could have had everything that Jesus said he would need in his life. He could have been someone today people could have, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Stephen. He could have been someone people named their son after. But instead, everything he thought was great is gone. Everything he could have had is gone. This week, remember what God has blessed you with. With that, God has blessed me with what? See, it only takes one moment to break bad. And it only takes one moment to break good. One simple choice. What I want you to do if you think about what God has blessed you with so far in your life. Even though you've made some poor choices. We all have. Even though you've made some poor choices and you still look back and see how much God's grace has overcome those poor choices and how much He has still blessed you with those poor choices. What I want you to do after you look at what God has blessed you with, think about this week. What more will He do? What more will He bless me with if I really get serious about my Christian walk? If I really get serious about following and serving Jesus? Because if He could do all that with a really lousy me, man, what could He do with all of me? It only takes one. Someone wrote this. In some moments... Falling in love at first sight, winning the lottery, having a car accident. You know instantly that your life has been changed. In others, you might have no idea of their significance until years later. But when you look back, you realize that that same small decision to go to a party, to make a phone call, to read that book, set in motion a whole series of events that turned out to be hugely significant in your life. Today, you have a chance. You have a choice. God's standards will always lead to God's blessings. They will always lead to the right thing in your life. They will always lead to what you need. They will always patch that hole in your heart that is left there because of issues with your dad or your mom or, or because of some horrible things that weren't your fault that were done to you. Those holes in your heart, when you follow God's standard and make Him the Lord and really get serious beyond going to heaven with Christianity, God always takes care of those. Blessings are always found when we follow God's standards. I remember this story and I'll close with it. It was a mom and she was a believer. She was really trying to serve Jesus. And so her local uh, high school uh, was having a PTA meeting. They were going to discuss their new sex ed uh, curriculum. 
And as they were going through it, they had all these professionals and teachers out there discussing about how they were going to do it and all the things and the birth controls that they were going to start handing out to kids. Because the, the thought kept coming, well, kids are going to do it, so they might as well at least know how to do it right. We might as well do all this. And the mom was listening to all this and thought, I don't want my daughter hearing all of these things. And she said, no, can I just say something? She said, why can't we talk to these kids about abstinence? Because it works every time it's driving. Why can't we discuss and try to push some basic morality on these kids? Our kids aren't animals. Can't we sort of expect more out of them? And the, the leaders up there just sort of laughed at them and all the other people. Said, that is so ridiculous. You can't think of that. That is just bizarre. What do you think? This is the, the 21st century. But stuff like that is impossible to ask. And she sat down and went on with her meeting. She just sat there and felt like such a failure. Like, what are we going to do? And so they dismissed her sort of part time. And they all went back and had coffee and donuts, like some of you are going to do. And they all went back and had coffee and donuts and everything. The mom just sat there in the front row and, and, and she just put her heads in her hand, head in her hand, and just, God, just give me something to say. I don't understand this. It just doesn't make sense. This is just, I don't, why am I here, God? Why, why is this happening? And so they all went and had their coffee, and then they came back and stuff. And so the leader said this. He said, okay, uh, to sort of demonstrate why this uh, curriculum is important, why we need to pass out this birth control and do the thing, you know what I'm talking about. Um, underneath all, one of your chairs is a red dot. And uh, look for it. Okay, okay. One of the gentlemen back, oh, it's mine. Okay, well, I want you to stand up. Okay. Now, everybody who shook hands with that man, stand up. Stand up. Now, everybody who shook hands with somebody standing up, standing up. And it didn't take long before almost everybody was standing up. And he was trying to make a point that when you have sex with one person, you have with all other people. And this is why we need to do this, because it's dangerous and you know, and everything. He's, you get the point he's trying to make. And the one lady who, who was praying there for God to give her wisdom and guidance and direction, she didn't go back. And everybody was standing except for her. And the light went on in her. And she sort of said, waved her hand. And the guy said, yes. And he said, she said, you know, you've been talking about that all this and this reason because we can't tell kids to wait and they're not possible to do it. And I would just like to point something out. Because I did not participate, I don't have to stand. Because I didn't conform to your values and your standards, I don't have to worry about all these other things. Young people, I've never known anyone at the end of their life who says, I mean, I wish I had slept around more in high school. I wish I had done more drugs and more partying. I wish I, but boy, I've been with her at the end of a life, and I've seen grown men, a, a senior citizens cry because of the tragedy and the pain their life has created because they could not control that one part of their life. When you don't conform to the world's standards, you don't have to participate in all the pain and the heartache and the issues that the world has to offer. But it all starts with what you value. It all starts with what your standards are. No one looking around with every head bowed.